Good afternoon, and welcome to our joint Good Friday service here at St. Andrew's United Presbyterian Church. We are delighted to have you joining us in worship this afternoon. We have musicians and worship leaders from a number of local Presbyterian churches leading worship today. They include leaders from Covenant Presbyterian Church, Hill United Presbyterian Church, North and East Butler Presbyterian Churches, St. Andrews, and Trinity Presbyterian Church. Thank you all for being here today. It is always such a privilege to share worship together. And now I invite you, wherever you are, to take a few minutes, take a few deep breaths in and out, and allow God's Spirit to fill your spirit as we listen to Even Star from Lars Morrison and Peggy McGurk. Join me in our responsive call to worship. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet, Yet we accounted him stricken, struck, struck down by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the punishment that made us whole, and by his bruises we are healed. Let us worship God. Please pray with me. Loving God, we are gathered in spirit, physically in different locations, and in different situations. But we come together united in our need, deep need, for your grace, 
drawn by your deeper, far deeper love for us. Lord, stop us and still us in this time of worship. Quiet our hearts and our minds and help us to be fully focused on your word for us. Use the words of our mouths, the songs of our hearts, the silence of our prayers. To deepen our faith, our trust, and our love through the grace of Christ. Amen. to be faithful, but we fall away. 
We flee and forsake you. We deny and betray you. Forgive us, Lord. Change us and transform us through the grace of your Son, our Savior. Amen. The proof of God's amazing love is this. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Friends, hear and believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Hear these words from the Gospel according to Mark, chapter 15, verses 1 through 15. I'll be reading from the Common English Bible. This is Jesus before Pilate. At daybreak, the chief priests with the elders, legal experts, and the whole Sanhedrin formed a plan. They bound Jesus led him away, and turned him over to Pilate. Pilate questioned him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus replied, That's what you say. The chief priests were accusing him of many things. So Pilate asked him again, Aren't you going to answer? What about all these accusations? But Jesus gave no more answers, so that Pilate marveled. During the festival, Pilate released one prisoner to them, whomever they requested. A man named Barabbas was locked up with the rebels who had committed murder during an uprising. The crowd pushed forward and asked Pilate to release someone, as he regularly did. Pilate answered them, Do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? He knew that the chief priests had handed him over because of jealousy. But the chief priests stirred up the crowd to have him release Barabbas to them instead. Pilate replied, Then what do you want me to do with the one you call king of the Jews? 
they shouted back, Crucify him. Pilate said to them, Why? What has he done wrong? They shouted even louder, Crucify him. Pilate wanted to satisfy the crowd, so he released Barabbas to them. He had Jesus whipped and then handed him over to be crucified. This is the word of our Lord. This week, many have been following the trial of Minneapolis police officer Derek Chauvin, who is accused of killing George Floyd last spring. The prosecution is currently in the process of bringing witnesses to the stand. And no matter what your take is on this story, it's clear that those who have watched this event, those who were there that day, have been incredibly impacted by them. Some powerful testimony came from Christopher Martin, a 19-year-old cashier at Cup Foods next to where George Floyd died. Martin explained that he was confident that Floyd tried to pay with a counterfeit $20 bill. The store policy, he said, is that if you as the cashier accept a counterfeit bill, you must then pay that amount back to the store out of your own paycheck. And even though he thought the bill was fake, Martin took it, planning to just pay the $20 later. But then he started to second guess himself. So he admitted to his manager what he had done wrong, and that manager then asked a coworker to call the police. And we know how that story ends. When asked by one of the prosecuting attorneys what was going through his mind as Floyd was being arrested, Martin said, disbelief and guilt. After further questioning, Martin hung his head and said, quote, if I would just not have taken the bill, this all could have been avoided. Martin feels personally responsible for George Floyd's death. And this sentiment of feeling helpless and scared and responsible and guilty ran all throughout the witness testimony this week. And I often wonder if that's how Pilate felt. While Martin did not intend for Floyd to die, Pilate was the one who made the order, even though all four Gospels highlight the fact that he did not think Jesus was guilty. Yet out of fear of the crowds and for her, his own self-preservation, Pilate condemned Jesus to death. We know from historical evidence that Pilate died around the year 39, but the circumstances are mysterious. Some traditions say he himself was sentenced to death by the state. Others say he died by suicide. The Ethiopian Orthodox Church believes that he converted to Christianity and he is a saint in their tradition. But whether he died by his own hand or that of the state or of natural causes, there's no doubt that Pilate carried extraordinary guilt with him the rest of his life. I'm sure it ate away at him. He probably spent sleepless nights reliving those events over and over, trying to figure out what else he could have done. Maybe you felt this way too. Maybe even today you are carrying guilt that weighs you down. Whether it's over something big or something minor, we all understand that feeling of guilt, a feeling that can only be taken away by forgiveness. And that is why Jesus died. 
Jesus made his way up the hill and he suffered the excruciating and humiliating death by crucifixion for Pilate, for Judas, for Christopher Martin, for George Floyd, for Derek Chauvin, for you and for me. Because by his death, we have all been forgiven. For the terrible things we have done, for the things we have not done, we are forgiven when we intentionally harm others and when our actions lead to unexpected consequences. That guilt that Pilate felt, that guilt that many of us carry, is real. It's valid. But so is the forgiveness that comes from the cross. It is important to sit in the darkness of this day to dwell in confession and grief. But let us not forget how the story ends. Amen. reading of the gospel of Jesus Christ according to Mark chapter 15 verses 16 through 20 New International Version the soldiers led Jesus away into the palace that is the praetorium and called together a whole company of soldiers they put a purple robe on him then twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on him and then they began to call out to him, Hail, King of the Jews! Again and again they struck him on the head with a staff and spit on him. Falling on their knees, they paid homage to him. And when they had mocked him, they took off the purple robe and put on his own clothes. Then they led him out to crucify him. Blessed are we in the hearing of God's holy word. So imagine the soldiers. Imagine what they saw. Imagine what they thought. Already showing signs of abuse 
and torture, they saw the man Jesus as no threat to anyone. They only saw the jealousy and impotence of an inferior people. They were staunch soldiers, after all, of the mighty Roman Empire. They defended such a mighty empire and their head, their chief of command, was touted as a son of God. Actually, their own coin reflected a divine title and a legacy of such. Not the God that we're familiar with at all, one that begets mercy and grace, but rather one who demands power and obedience, who is vulturous in his actions, who rules by tyranny, deceit, and betrayal. The man, Jesus, was given over by his own religious cohorts. Obviously not his religious authorities. Clearly, he was no threat. No threat at all, and especially to the tribunal soldiers. But his own people claimed that he willfully undermined their own nation. He opposed the taxes of Caesar and claimed to be a king, a messiah. Each in their own right was an offense to Rome. Who, who are these people? that fear this man. Surely had to be a thought that went through the Roman soldiers' minds. He's already been flogged and beaten with an instrument that has an ugly legacy. It is a shortened handle with two or three strands of rope or leather entwined with glass or bone, metal, and weights, hooks even, a barb, Obviously meant to inflict pain, but most certainly, and more so, to cause the loss of blood, weakening the victim, and in the case of a pending crucifixion, to weaken them to the point of just having enough energy to carry their own crossbeam to their own crucifixion. In Jesus' case, he was unwilling to even, unable to do even that. With exposed, bows, with exposed bones and whatever followed that, the gory scene was a reminder of just what happened to those who came opposed to the law of the land. First Roman and now apparently even Jewish. Yet the soldiers took no pity on this man, none at all. He was physically, totally overwhelmed. They fed off of his weakness and each other's mockery. They wrapped him in a purple robe, mocking his majesty. They hid their own acts of treachery by wrapping him tight, beating him, mocking him, knowing full well when they tore that robe off the ravaged body of Jesus, the pain that would be inflicted by tearing the clotted blood away would equal the pain that caused it. They mocked him with a crown of thorns, not a wreath of a victor's crown that they were used to seeing on that very coin that they heralded, but one that would cause more pain and more blood loss. They jeered. They cajoled. They had no compassion on the man that had nothing more than compassion on them. Forgive them, Father. They know not what they do. In his suffering, Jesus suffered the pain that some of us might come to endure, no matter how. And no matter by who. And was resurrected from it. In their mockery, Jesus endured the jeering of our days, not always by the people we meet, but prompted by that thief. 
who comes to steal, to kill, and destroy. The one who reminds us of our past attempts and failures as we try so hard to put down our hurts and fleshly desires. Even the attempts to be good enough to earn God's favor. In his forgiveness, Jesus vanquishes those failures of ours, seen and unseen. In his resurrection, Jesus brings new life out of the grave of shame. To he who overcomes, I will give a crown of life. The ugliness and darkness of this Friday only becomes good because of Resurrection Sunday. Only becomes good of Resurrection Sunday. We are the people of hope because of this day. And it will always be the darkest day known to mankind because it gives us a glimpse of just what we are capable of left to ourselves. Thankfully, we are not. We have a God who loves us and has come to save us. We're hopeful because we have a merciful God who endures what we cannot so that we can enjoy a life that we would not unless he led the way. It is said the best way through a minefield is to follow someone. And that may be true, but how many will it take to follow? In following Jesus Christ, there is only one. It's only he that stands victorious. And so therefore, to him be all the glory, laud, and honor. He is the, the one that can do more than anyone could ask or even possibly imagine. Here's to your answering his call on your heart today. And then, for you, dear saint, you'll come to know how good this Friday is. Amen.
Hear now a reading from Mark 15, verses 21 through 32, the crucifixion of Jesus. I will be reading from the New Revised Standard Version. The soldiers compelled a passerby who was coming in from the country to carry his cross. It was Simon of Cyrene, the father of Alexander and Rufus. Then they brought Jesus to the place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. And they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. And they crucified him and divided his clothes among them, casting lots to decide what each would take. It was nine o'clock in the morning when they crucified him. The inscription of the charge against him read, The King of the Jews. And with him they crucified two bandits, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by derided him, shaking their heads and saying, Aha! You who would destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself and come down from the cross. In the same way, the chief priests, along with the scribes, were also mocking him among themselves and saying, He saved others. He cannot save himself. Let the Messiah, the King of Israel, come down from the cross now so that we may see and believe. Those who were crucified with him also taunted him. The Gospel of the Lord. Glory be to thee, O Christ. Pray with me. Our Father and our God, make us masters of ourselves that we may become the servants of others. Take my lips and speak through them. Take our minds and think through them. Take our hearts and set them on fire. For we would see Jesus in these moments. In his name and for his sake we pray. Amen. I came across a striking painting by the surrealist artist Beate Heinen, painted in 1986. It shows a cave in the left front where Mary and Joseph hold vigil over their young baby Jesus. He is resting in a manger that looks like a marble coffin. He is holding his mother's hand. His father looks to be in an attitude of prayer. From this place, a road emerges and leads off over many miles of terrain. The path, the road, winds its way eventually up a steep, bare hill in the distance where three men are being crucified. Beate Heinen titled the painting, The Manger and the Cross. I started to think this through in preparation for today. I would like you to imagine with me the interweaving of the manger, the cross, and the road that connects them. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, asking, where is the child who has been born king of the Jews? For we observed his star at its rising and have come to pay him homage. There he is. Just there, being led by the cordon box of soldiers. Can't you see the placard held up by the soldier in front? King of the Jews. 
When King Herod heard this from the wise men, he was frightened in all Jerusalem with him. They're taking the long way around for this crucifixion at the place of the skull. <laughs> Don't kid yourself. The authorities want to make sure every street and alley of unruly people sees the price one pays to claim a crown in the shadow of Rome. Via Dolorosa. The way of suffering. On entering the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they knelt down and paid him homage. And then opening their treasure chest, they offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. He says he's thirsty. Mix a little myrrh with the wine vinegar and offer it to him. It will help to dull the pain. You know what the good book says. Give strong drink to one who is perishing. And wine to those in bitter distress. Why won't he take it? Along the way... James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came forward to him and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, What is it you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Grant us to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left in your glory. But Jesus said to them, you do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? They replied, we are able. Then Jesus said to them, the cup that I drink you will drink and with the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or at my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. <laughs> Isn't that just like Rome? Make a spectacle out of it. Look who's keeping company with the king on the cross. A bandit on the right and a bandit on the left. A Christmas view of Golgotha. Stable, warm, quiet in the lull, bleak and cold, the place of the skull. Stillness shattered by man-child wails, spat upon, cursed, and brutally flailed. Few there were to see the boy born, Crowds crush round to mock and to scorn. A comet hails him as the light. Midday bears the black of night. Blessed child of manger and straw, killed by those who keep the law. Baby's cheeks flushed and red. Pierced by hate. Hanging. Dead. Joy of 
Mary and her wonder, incarnate, to be torn asunder. O oh, innocent child from above, you must die for us to love. Friends, the journey we take with Jesus begins in a place called Bethlehem and ends this side of Easter on Calvary's hill. The road, the path that Jesus walks with his disciples, with us, winds its way from Galilee to Golgotha. Jesus had to go this way. It was the way of his life. The painter showed it with her picture quite clearly. The cross and the manger belong together. His birth finds its fulfillment in his death. Yet both together guarantee us life. On this Good Friday, we do well to remember and give thanks to God for both. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Recorded in the Gospel of Mark, the 15th chapter, beginning with the 33rd verse. When it was noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. At three o'clock, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which means, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of the bystanders heard it, they said, Listen, he is calling for Elijah. And someone ran, filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on a stick, and gave it to him to drink, saying, Wait. Let us see whether Elijah will come to take him down. Then Jesus gave a loud cry and breathed his last. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Now when the centurion who stood facing him saw that in this way he breathed his last, he said, Truly, this man was the Son of God. Let us pray. On this Good Friday, dear God, help us to see Jesus. Amen. There are so many vivid images in our minds on this Good Friday. 
there is the image of Jesus being arrested, Jesus being put to trial, Jesus being mocked, Jesus being beaten, Jesus carrying his cross, not able even to stand, Jesus being nailed to that cross, Jesus breathing his last. And in all of these vivid images, there's one image that sometimes we forget. And it is the image of the curtain in the temple being torn in two from top to bottom. That curtain was the curtain that cordoned off the Holy of Holies the most sacred place in the temple, the place where the people of God believed that the holiness of God dwelt. This was where God was, and it was only once a year that the high priest was allowed to go behind that curtain to offer sacrifice to the Most High God only once a year. And when Jesus breathed his last, that curtain was torn from top to bottom. This was a very heavy curtain, a very solemn curtain, a curtain symbolizing the division between ourselves and God symbolizing that we could not dare to approach the living God face to face only once a year and only with sacrifices. Jesus was that sacrifice. And on this Good Friday, he paid the price. He paid the price for our sin. And that curtain was no longer necessary. There did not have to be a division between ourselves and God. That curtain was torn in two for all time. Dear people of God, we now are able to stand face to face and talk to Jesus. We do not need to be separated from him any longer. We can speak to him, we can take his hand, we can know his presence. The curtain in the temple was torn in two for all time. Jesus gave us an unspeakable gift the gift of love and forgiveness, the gift of a new beginning. Wherever you are right now with Jesus, he's reaching out to you. He gave his life for you. The curtain in the temple was torn from top to bottom for you. And we can talk to him face to face. Jesus loves us more than we can know. Thanks be to God for the gift of this Good Friday. Let us pray. O oh God, our Father, the curtain in the temple was torn from top to bottom for all time. And we can talk to you. We are forgiven. We have a new beginning we can take the hand of Jesus. We can know that we are loved. Thank you for that great gift. Amen.
Go now in peace, for Jesus our Lord died for you. Go now in joy, go now in hope, go now knowing that you are greatly loved. Amen.